Anton, that was such a kind introduction, so flattering. Uh, in fact, that was exactly the way I wrote it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it is still morning, folks. Good morning to you. Imagine it's two years from today, and you've just finished this same conference, but something has changed in your world. You walk out to the car parking lot, and you've been networking and chatting with your friends and colleagues for a while. Time has gone by, you're one of the last to leave. So when you arrive in the car park, there are only one or two cars left, and yours is right in the middle. You reach into your pocket and you take out the car keys to the brand new, top of the range, 7 Series BMW. And this thing is a tech fest. You press the button, open the door, and expensive air escapes. <laughs> It lights up like the Starship Enterprise, and you lower yourself down into this world of leather and luxury and wood and opulence. And it's not just the wood, the leather and the luxury, it's the tech as well. Because this car will park itself, it will drive itself, it'll go in and out of your garage without you having to worry about it. It will even massage you as you go. You know you've arrived when even your car is willing to touch you indecently. <laughs> And you think back on what's changed over the course of the last couple of years. What mindset shift, what thing did you do that altered your trajectory so radically that you were able to pick up a thing like this without even thinking about the price tag? Because what are we sitting at now for the new 7 series? Somewhere around, what, 1.82 million rand, something ridiculous like that. And you trace it back to a single decision, which was this. And it's a decision most people will, ever, will never make. You decided to position yourself as a top name in your industry. Or in other words, you made the decision to become an expert by design. Let's take a moment to look at just how powerful that is. I'd like to step you out of your industry for a moment, and I'll put up on the screen a couple of examples of different <coughs> industries that we're not involved in, different spheres of life, spheres of interest. Let's see if we can get the top name in every single one. What do you think of, first name that springs to mind, if I say bodybuilder? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. What are the catchphrases? I'll be back. Hasta la vista, baby. Come with me if you want to live. Perhaps more recently, vote for me if you want to live. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, ladies in the room, anyone find that attractive? No? The poor dude worked so hard. <laughs> I had a conference the other day with 200 ladies in a room and I asked the same question. Anyone find that attractive? And from where I'm standing, I can see 199 ladies all go, eh, no, ew, gross. But there's one woman at the back of the room just starting to raise her hand. She's like, I'll keep that to myself. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. The man has won Mr. Olympia seven times and that is absolutely remarkable. But folks, did you know that there are two men who have won the Mr. Olympia contest eight times. They outperformed Arnold Schwarzenegger. Why did his name come to mind first for us? And they did it more recently. In fact, the last time this man competed as a professional bodybuilder was in the year 1980. That's over three decades ago. There are people in this room who were born after he stopped and still think of him as the top name in bodybuilding. That's remarkable. The question is, what can we learn from that, and what can we use from that? Here's another one. What if I give you horror writer? It's got to be Stephen King. 0.25 of a second, and we all get the same answer. The man who did for clowns what Spielberg did for sharks. <laughs> the first novel I ever read, and I was like nine years old at the time, I snuck it past my parents, was Stephen King's Misery. My friends reckon that explains a lot about why I am the way I am today. <laughs> Stephen King, one of the world's best-selling living writers, and that is despite runaway success stories like J.K. Rowling with Harry Potter, and in spite of phenomena like Fifty Shades of Grey. Mr. King has been doing it longer. And the interesting thing is, this man doesn't know what it feels like to write a book and not have it go to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. It has never happened to him. And his name has gained such momentum and has such pull that his novels are now bestsellers before they're released. They don't exist, and they are already climbing the bestseller lists because it's Stephen King. 
And in fact, take a look at any of the stores in your local CNA or exclusive books, and with every other author, you'll see this big title and author name. It's reversed with Mr. King. Stephen King, name of the novel. That's interesting to us. What can we learn? What can we take away from that? Let's keep going. What if I give you computer mode? You're going to get one of two here. Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, it's going to be one of those names. How about daytime TV talk show? Oprah. It's got to be Oprah. Now what's interesting about this one is I reckon Oprah is a Schwarzenegger. And here's what I mean by that. I think in 30 years from now, when we talk about daytime TV talk shows, it will still be Oprah. How about if I give you car show? <laughs> Here's a controversial one. It was. Give me, not a car show, give me a human being. It's got to be Jeremy Clarkson, the best car show in the world. Until he punched his producer in the face. <laughs> Interesting thing with Clarkson here, he broke the rules and as you know, he got himself fired. And he has just been signed up for a multi-million dollar deal by the next group because he's Clarkson. Now, what does that mean, because he's Clarkson? Think about this, how many car shows are there around the world? How many hundreds, how many thousands of motoring journalists are there around the world? But I say car show, that's the name that springs to mind for you. And Clarkson didn't earn and doesn't earn 10 times more than the other motoring <coughs> journalists around him. He earns on the order of 100 times more than anyone else. Folks, what would it do to your life to add an extra zero to the end of your salary? Imagine the changes that would make. In fact, actually, take a moment and imagine how that would change the type of clientele that you're willing to deal with. The deals that you will and will not do. Your life going forward, what would change with an extra zero? Expert positioning is the art of adding an extra zero to your annual income. And there are specific ways of doing it. Now, of course, the question is, does this man have greater technical skill, greater knowledge, uh, perhaps a more academic background than, the, than other investigative or motoring journalists? And the answer is no. There's something else going on, and it's worth an extra zero to Clarkson. And it can be emulated. What if I give you naughty men's magazines? I don't want a magazine, I want a man. It's got to be Hugh Hefner. For anyone confused, Hugh is the one with the bow tie. <laughs> Love or hate what this man does. Morally object to the industry that he propagates. Even people who don't like what he does for a living still watch the show, Girls of the Playboy Mansion. And still helped him with this rolling success story in terms of marketing and branding and perception. And when each of the girls moved out of the Playboy Mansion, each one got her own reality TV show. And even people who don't like what this man does for a living continue to follow their likes, their dislikes, their ins, their outs. Maybe an unfortunate turn of phrase. <laughs> <laughs> the things that they did on a daily basis. Now, we've had consensus for every name here. What if I give you skateboarding? There's an obscure one. Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk. How's that? Here we are on the southern tip of the continent of Africa. This is predominantly a Californian thing. Tony Hawk hasn't really done anything in the last 10, 15 years, and yet we still get that name in a room this small. That's astonishing. Let's go one further. No name, no face, who's that? Nigella Lawson. Did you recognize her by her cherries? <laughs> Nigella Lawson has something similar to Clarkson going on. Do you think she is the world's most qualified chef? No. Do you think she's in the top 10 of the world's most qualified chefs? No. Do you reckon she's in the top 100 of the world's most qualified chefs? So why is she out earning all of them combined? That's an interesting question. Sexy. <laughs> Sexy. That's the politically correct answer. I've heard words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I used to leave it blank and let people guess, but then they go, Ooh, Tony Robbins! And that hurt me here. <laughs> so the real question then is, why not you? Why shouldn't you own your industry? Why shouldn't yours be the top name that springs to mind without even thinking, just a visceral reaction for people when they think of your world? Well, let's start with a more difficult question, which is, why bother? Because although these people are earning a heck of a lot of money, it is incredibly hard 
to get to the top of any industry. I believe that there are three reasons why it's worth your while to position yourself as an expert. The first and most obvious one is the money. Experts earn exponentially more than the people around them. It's not a little bit more, often it's not even ten times more. It goes into orders of magnitude. It changes things. That's the first reason. The second reason is perhaps a little bit more noble. Anyone here have kids? Quick survey around the room. Yeah. Uh, you know, raise your hands if you're not sure, but there's a very good chance. Yeah. You'll know how immensely rewarding it can be when you teach your child something that they didn't get before. And there's that moment where the penny drops, the lights go on, and suddenly they get it. It's like their world becomes a little bit bigger because of your influence. They've suddenly got more levers with which to access life and influence the world around them. And coaching and mentoring and teaching, or in other words, being a thought leader, being the top name in an industry, is like that on a bigger scale. Instead of reacting to changes in an industry, you, in part, get to determine where the whole machine goes. Deeply rewarding. You go from being a cog in a system to a major voice leading things forward. That's the second reason it's worth your while. And the third, and perhaps the most interesting reason to us today, is that positioning yourself as an expert radically overhauls how you go about your sales and marketing efforts. And to make this come alive for you, just use your imagination for a second and picture a large crowd of people. Now this crowd represents all of your potential target market, your customers, your fans, your loyal uh, base of followers for the rest of your working life. So I want you to be generous with yourself and picture a huge crowd. Now, let's put them out in the sun. And we'll walk along the outskirts of this crowd and just listen to conversations and hear the bustle and immerse ourselves in this world. Now, coming the other way, also walking around the crowd, you'll meet another character. Because wherever we have a large crowd of people, there's always that low-level entrepreneur trying to make a quick buck off of your fans, your followers. And for some reason that I can't explain, I picture a guy selling pies. Don't know why. And also for another reason I can't explain, I picture him in sort of medieval costume. I've got something like a, like a Robin Hood or a Pied Piper going on. There he is in his green tights with the little curly toes, and he's holding a tray, and on this tray is this big steaming pile of pies. And he's tapping people on the shoulder one by one. And as they turn around, he says, would you like to buy a pie? Because there are so many of them, from time to time, one person will say yes, and they will hand over a coin, and he will hand over a pie. Now, to make another coin, our pie man has to tap another shoulder and sell another pie. If he goes home, his business model comes to an end. No tapping of shoulders, no sales, no money. You don't want to be the pie man in your industry. So what's the alternative? In your mind's eye, look over the head of the crowd, and in the distance is a hillside. And halfway up this hillside is the guru. Now that's you. The guru is the person that everyone has assembled to listen to. Not because you're trying to make a quick buck, but because you have ideas about how their lives can be better. You have education to share with them, you have visions for the future, you have entertainment, you're just compelling, and they want to be around you. You don't want to be the pie man in your industry. You want to be the guru. Or otherwise stated, you don't want to have to go to them. You want them to come to you. Now, how do we practically go about making that happen? Well, as you heard earlier, in the book on expert positioning, there are 50 ways to go about doing it. Today, I'd like to share the ones that I've selected that are the most relevant for you. Our starting point is to ask ourselves, what is an expert? And I'm not interested in academic sort of uh, ideas here or definitions. I reckon experts exist at the intersection of three qualities. And you have to have all three working together or you disqualify yourself as an industry expert. Interestingly, most people only have one or two of these. One of them tends to elude most people. Take a look and see if you can guess what they are. The one on the left-hand side, your left, is the most obvious. What is that? Knowledge. Knowledge. You've got to know your stuff. Now that's actually the one I'm spending the least time on because I'm assuming you know your stuff by now. Knowledge. You cannot be an industry expert without knowing your stuff. But more is required of you. Most people never get this far. 
The one on top is the one we are never taught in school and we very rarely talk about in our home life, in our families. We don't teach our children this. Any guesses what that might be? Six. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Give that man a bell. Listen, <laughs> only one. He's already... Uh... <laughs> Honestly, that is a part of it, but it's not the whole thing. <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson fits that uh, the definition on top, and I don't find him terribly sexy. <laughs> about you. The answer there is personality. Charisma is a big part of it as well. Personality. And that can be anything. It can be the sex appeal, the charisma, uh, but it doesn't mean you have to be an over-the-top character, because Jamie Oliver, who is a fairly quiet bloke, has that as well. Personality. And the last one is publicity. Knowledge, personality, publicity. Take those three on a roadshow, you have the ingredients for an expert. Take one of them out of the mix, and at best, you have a specialist. Let me show you how this works, and we'll pick on the world of IT for this one. So in every large company, in any major city anywhere in the world, you'll always have that one guy who's been working for the company for the last 20, 30 years. And this is the guy who knows everything about the company. He knows all the wiring, all the systems, all the programs, all the applications, how everything works together, the entire ecosystem, it's all hidden in his brain. But to find this guy, you don't get into the elevator and go up to the executive suite and find his corner office. No, no. You get into the lift and you go down to the third floor basement. You get out in the damp and the gloom and you walk past the old VW Beetle that burnt out in the 1980s and has just been abandoned there. Don't worry, you're on the right track. You'll get to a door that says janitor, but it's crossed out and under it with sticky tape. They've affixed a little thing that says IT. You've reached his office. Open the creaky door, kick the pizza boxes out of the way, and there in the back of the room, hiding in the gloom and staring at you with large eyes like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, is this guy who has all the information, all the knowledge, all the wisdom, but no idea how to speak to other human beings. Have you ever met this guy? Yeah. There are examples of him everywhere, and the tragedy is he is being remunerated on the level of a specialist, but not revered as an industry leader. And what's missing there is the personality. Knowledge, personality, publicity. Put those three together and you have a potent mix for an industry expert. Now, practically speaking, what can you do when you have those three things in place? Here are some ideas for how you can own your industry by doing things differently. The first one. Amateurs have jobs, but experts have a cause. Amateurs have jobs, but experts have a cause. And the idea that you are changing something in the world around you, that you are championing a cause or a mission changes the way you go about the things you do. And here's just a silly example. Let's say, for example, that you sell soap. You're a soap company. It's not very obvious that there is a built-in cause or a built-in mission to what you do. And yet Dove managed to find a way to get around that one. Dove launched the Real Beauty campaign a while ago. And it went viral, and it enjoyed hundreds of millions of dollars worth of free advertising. You may have seen the videos on YouTube. Simple idea was two friends walk in and see an artist. And the artist faces away from both of them. He's not allowed to see the people he's drawing. Now, the, the first person, the lady, will describe herself to the artist, and he will draw her just based on what he hears. Then the friend will step in and describe the first person again. And consistently, 100% of the time, the friend describing the other person came out more beautiful. And it's just this interesting look at how we perceive ourselves and real beauty. And the idea was to recapture what real beauty is from the Hollywood stereotypes and the, uh, the Paris fashion walk stereotypes and talk to human beings again to lead a cause rather than just selling soap. Surprisingly often, though, we don't spot the cause that's built into what we do. There's a great show on um, BBC called Mary Queen of Shops. Anyone ever seen that one? Yeah? Doesn't matter if you haven't. The idea is Mary is a business consultant and she works in the UK. She goes into stores that are dying on their feet and turns them around and makes them profitable. One day she goes into a store that is the British equivalent of our Donna Claire, selling clothes for plus-sized ladies. 
And she discovers that this store is absolutely, I mean, they're, they're a week away from closing the doors. And she spends a little time just watching the owner of the store interacting with the very few customers who walk through the door. And she notices a couple of interesting things. The first is that the lady running the store doesn't seem to like her customers. The person will come in and she'll say things like, yeah, I can see you've got some problem ankles there, love. We'll find a way to cover that up for you, don't you worry. And before you leave the store, don't worry, we'll get rid of that unsightly bulge you've got, that muffin top around the, uh, the middle over there. Uh, we'll fix that for you, darling. And Mary watches this with her jaw dropping. And she digs a little bit deeper. She discovers that the owner of the store has two jobs. The one is running the store during the day, and the other is as a gym fitness instructor at night. She, in her own words, done much like fat people. But now here's a person who not only is offending her clients, but she's missed an opportunity. If she thought of herself as running a cause rather than just reacting to incoming customers, she would be on the radio, she would be on TV, she would be speaking in public, she'd be writing articles, creating pamphlets, giving away knowledge for free, teaching her clientele how to need what she does. She'd be sharing information on the right thing to wear on a first date, the right thing to wear on a job interview, what to wear to the beach, to a dinner, to give away the information, be on their side, help them make their lives better. You start becoming the guru on the hillside and then this magical thing starts to happen, and this is what we're after. Whenever people are discussing that world, they'll say, you know who you should talk to about that? And you are the name at the end of that suggestion. You know who you should talk to about that? Give away the knowledge for free. Start to create tribes of believing followers. Number two, and that follows on from that, experts teach their markets how to need them. One of my local malls, there are flower sellers at both entrances, but they see themselves in very different ways. The guy selling flowers on this side is really, he's a pie man. He's a, a low-level seller of flowers. You walk up to his counter, he might even greet you if he's in a good mood. He understands his job as, I hand over flowers, people hand over money, that is all. Now the lady on the other side of the mall sees her world very differently. The flowers in her world are incidental. She is a teacher, a guide, and a guru. And it translates in simple little ways that make a big difference. You get to her counter, and there are beautiful little pamphlets with floral decorations, and it says, free, take one. And the pamphlets have simple information that help her clients and her target market. They say things like, summer is coming, five ways to make your home look more open using flowers this season. Or it might be, winter is coming, Five ways to make your home look warmer this season. And then she speaks to another target market. She says, how to use uh, flowers in the, uh, in the chapel on your wedding day. And then it will be something like play on fear factor. Six things brides do wrong with flowers on their special day. Now, do you think a bride is going to have to take that information? Yes. You can't leave that behind. You have to have it. And what she's doing is simply teaching her target market how to meet her. <coughs> I believe that the top experts and the world's best experts give away their best ideas, their best guidance and solutions for free. Whether you do that on YouTube, in articles, on TV, on the radio, give away your best ideas for free. The strange thing is, people then come to you for the implementation. Don't hoard the ideas. They're of greater value when you give them away. Experts teach their markets how to need them. Experts speak in outcomes, not delivery mechanisms. This is a subtle one, but it's an important one. Take that bridge that you see on the screen and demolish it. Bring it down to its constituent parts so that you end up with a big pile of rubble, bricks and mortar and iron railings. There are limits to how much you can sell that pile of bricks and rubble and mortar and stone uh, for in the real world. But add the expertise that allows two cities to do trade and that thing becomes exponentially more valuable. So, again, it's a subtle shift, but it's an important one. Are you selling the box that the thing comes in? Are you selling the physical thing, the paperwork, the meeting, the, the delivery mechanism? Or are you selling a change in people's words? Here's a very simple and very practical example. This is a guy advertising to do wedding videos for brides on Facebook. 
This is a real ad. <coughs> now, ladies, would you book this guy to film your special day? No. What's wrong with this ad? <coughs> He's selling the camera. He's advertising the delivery mechanism. No one cares about the camera. Now, this is what his competitors are doing. I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> The bride or the photo? <laughs> These competitors are selling your magic moments captured for the rest of your days. Your special memories handed down through the generations. And that's the difference. If I'm doing it wrong, I charge for 60 minutes of speaking. If I'm doing it right, I charge for changing the bottom line of a business. So what is your outcome? What's the difference after you've interacted with your clients? And how, how much focus do you have on selling that rather than the delivery mechanism? That's one of the small things that sets experts apart. In fact, speaking in outcomes can win you the deal. I'll just leave that very uncomfortable visual there on the screen for a while. A while back, I was consulting with a company that had the pitch of a lifetime. They had a business deal coming up for what could be, if they landed it properly, retirement money. Now, essentially what they did is they created a program that helped banks to find terrorists. The problem that they were facing, though, is that even though they were pitching to the CEO and some of the top directors in one of the big four banks on this upcoming date, they knew that they were up against four other competitors whose programs looked exactly the same. The programs have to work in a certain way, so there's very little variation between them. And this happens in a surprising number of businesses around South Africa. So, they call me in for a little bit of help on their business pitch, and I sit down with them and I say, all right, let's see what you've got so far. They go, great, so we start like this. You click start on the computer program, you go to file, and then you go down to the menu that says, and I said, well, hang on a second, stop. You're showing us how to run the program. Is the CEO ever going to use that program? And they said, well, no. And I said, who's going to use it? And they said, well, realistically, it's the cashiers in a branch. Guy walks in, wants to open an account. Those are the people who are going to be using the program. And I said, well, then he's not going to care about a product demonstration. What does he care about? And we did a little bit of digging and a bit of thinking around that. And it turned out that there was legislation coming down the pipeline that would ensure that the CEO was personally liable if he didn't implement a system like this. Well, we sort of debated, do you think he maybe cares about that? The answer, of course, is yes. So here's how we changed the pitch. We went from, here's how you run the program, to we're not even here to sell you a program. We understand that you are already standing with your feet in the fire. We get the severity of the problem, and we understand that the legislation is coming, and coming quickly. We're not here to sell you a program because, frankly, they're all identical. They all look exactly the same. We are here to completely rescue you from the coming flames. The program is a part of it, but it's only a part of it. We're going to make sure that by the time we leave, you're able to sleep at night. And that's how they won their pitch. Selling the outcome, not the delivery mechanism. It's the humanity. It's the thing that changes in people's lives. What else can we do to make sure that we speak like experts? Here's a tricky one, so watch carefully. Experts know that appearance is everything, and so they appear. That's a slippery little hobbit right there. Experts know that appearance is everything, so they appear. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that it matters that the suit you wear comes from Italy, that your car was made in Germany, that you wear a watch created in Switzerland or that your shoes are Italian. No, I'm saying that in every industry there are forums and there are forums where all the right people are watching and listening and that is where you need to be seen. Now most of us don't enjoy speaking in public. It's something that I quite like but it, even for myself there's always a fear factor built into it. Quick survey, who here does enjoy speaking in public? Yeah, a couple of hands around the room. They did a survey once in the States where they asked people the exact same question. They, in fact, they asked a uh, slight variation on that. They said, what is your number one fear in the world? And death came second. <laughs> <laughs> Public speaking topped the list. And what that teaches us is that at your average funeral, most people would rather be the guy in the box <laughs> than the one delivering the eulogy. 
And yet, speaking in public is immensely powerful as a positioning tool. Think about it in terms of a simple networking event. You go to a networking event, you're the pie man. You've got to tap people on the shoulder one by one and hand out business cards. But if you're seen speaking at the front of the room, you're the guru. Everybody gets to know who you are in one go, and afterwards they come to you. Now it's not just public speaking, it's also volunteering to get onto radio, into the media, onto TV, uh, writing articles, whether that's online or actual articles for Forbes or Sales Guru or whatever the case might be. Outlets chew through content. If you have useful ideas, you can get free publicity. The simple trick to it is just to give away good ideas for free, rather than sounding like you're doing a sales pitch. At the end, you have your details, you have your website, your email address, whatever the case might be. Give it away for free, let them come to you. And that's position. Sometimes, the human being makes all the difference in the world. I did the talk on expert positioning um, for one of the business schools that competes with Gibbs. And every year, they come second or third, and Gibbs is always at the top of the pile. And I happened to be sitting next to the marketing manager of this school afterwards, this business school. And he said, you know what, I've been wondering for years why these guys always seem to come out on top. Because we have the same courses, we have the same textbooks, sometimes we even have the same lecturers. All the same content, why can't we topple them? And he said, as I was listening to the presentation, the penny dropped for me. He gave me this marvelous phrase, and this was like a little gift for me. He says, you know what it is? The difference is in the dean. The difference is in the dean. He says the dean is always seen speaking in public. The dean of Gibbs, just stepped down a little while ago, is always seen on TV, heard on the radio, out there, being a face and a voice in the public consciousness. And that is worth everything to them. He says our own dean, by comparison, doesn't like speaking in public, is a bit retiring, a shy personality, doesn't want to put himself out there. The difference is in the dean. Sometimes when your offering is identical to your competitors, it's you, the human being, your own expert positioning that brings the business to you. Sometimes that's a terrifying prospect. Because most of us are not Clarksons. We are not Nigella Lawsons. We're not over-the-top, vivacious personalities. Again, think of someone like a Jamie Oliver. He's a quiet, down-to-earth bloke, but he appears on TV. He produces books, he writes articles, you see his face, you hear his voice. I don't for a second suggest that you change your personality. All that I'm saying is take your own unique, authentic personality on a road show. Put it out there. Be a face and a voice in the public consciousness. The more you are, the more you start getting that sentence, you know who you should talk to about that. What else can you do? Experts use high impact communication. I believe very strongly in this one. Begs the question, what is low impact communication? One of the worst examples from all human history has to be this one. Anyone know which particular space shuttle you're looking at there? The one that blew up, yeah. The one that blew up, yes, in fact it is, it's Challenger. The photo that you are looking at here was taken 75 seconds before the five men and two women on board lost their lives. It's an incredible thing to look at that photograph and just look at the energy and vitality of the thing and realize that's a disaster, busy happening. There are some incredibly emotive facts that came out of this one. They did the reconnaissance afterwards. And in the shuttle area, all of the levers and dials are locked into place against this immense thrust, the G-force of takeoff. When they did the reconnaissance, they found that the levers and dials had been manually and physically unlocked. What that teaches us is that in the 75 seconds after that photo was taken, the five men and two women on board were fighting to save their own lives. It's an incredible thought. From a communications perspective, the thing we learn is even more interesting. Some of the scientists at NASA knew that this was going to happen. It's a very technical story. The simple version of it is this. It spent too much time on the launch pad and ended up with a faulty O-ring. The guys at NASA who were concerned about this thing and were convinced it was going to be a disaster sat down, got a committee together, and produced over a thousand pages of charts and graphs and dots and dashes and weekly lines and scientific information proving that this thing was going to go wrong. As fast as they could, they submitted it to their superiors. Do you think the message got through? 
thousand pages of charts and graphs, and somewhere in all of that mess, the message died a slow death. It would have been infinitely more effective to have sent one page with red letters, it's going to explode, and a couple of exclamation marks. Experts understand the difference between having the information and making a message come alive. That, in fact, is what sets this man apart. There are people in the world who know more about cars than Clarkson, or at least as much. But Clarkson has an interesting little skill, and you see it in the show, and you can read it in his columns, which of course are produced in his books as well. They make very good reading. Clarkson doesn't talk in facts and figures at all. In fact, one year, Top Gear won Best Factual Documentary at the BBC Awards Show. Clarkson walks up to the stage, picks up the trophy, looks at it and says, well, thanks very much for this, but we haven't used a fact in our show in the last five years. <laughs> and sits back down again. And it's true, they don't. They talk in stories and metaphors and analogies. They talk in similes, they talk in dreams and in humor and in little story pictures that make ideas come alive. Some of his better similes and metaphors have actually gone into the book on expert positioning. Uh, some of the ones that I love. An average motoring journalist might say things like, most cars are heavy, supercars, are heavy and hard to manage, but this one is light and agile, not Clarkson. Your average supercar is like wrestling an elephant up the back stairs of a loft, yeah. but this one is like rubbing honey into Kiara Knightley. <laughs> <laughs> now that's vivid. You remember the things that these guys say. And most of it, I mean, if you go through, uh, through Top Gear and actually study it as a communications exercise, they are masters at making ideas come alive for people. And what's interesting to see is that other motoring shows, and even the written motoring journalism, has now started to follow this track. People speak in metaphors, stories, ideas that make things come alive for you. I try and do it as much as I can as well. The Pie Man and the Guru, it's a mental uh, metaphor, it's a story that makes ideas come alive. So the question for you is, as you're interacting with your clients, your, um, your fans or followers, when you are selling, when you're pitching, anything that is a public forum event, are you doing data dumps and burying people in, in information, or are you making ideas come alive for them? That's one of the things that goes into personality and makes you memorable. What else can we do? We'll speak at greater length about innovation later on. And in fact, for that reason, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular one. I normally sort of hint at this uh, and give a little bit of value, but later on this afternoon, I have a full hour presentation on innovation for you. So, suffice to say for now that out innovating the competition makes you unique. If you can do things differently to the way everyone else is doing it, you become a category of one. Later this afternoon, I'll show you how to do that. And finally, experts add a unique signature. It's a guy in Johannesburg who graduates as an architect, and he gets his commission to build his first home. Because it's his first one, he wants to do something that sets it apart, some kind of unique signature. He comes up with a simple idea. He builds a little Zen garden on the roof of this house, and you can access it from inside. They can walk up the stairs and have little picnics up on the roof, and the people who move in absolutely love it. They tell their friends and they tell their family because it has bragging rights for them. Next thing, his phone rings. Are you the guy who builds gardens on roofs? Not how much do you charge? How experienced are you? What's your academic background? No, are you the person with the novelty that I heard about? And he gets his second commission. It then starts picking up around this neighborhood. Word of mouth gets out. <coughs> After that, he appears on Talk Radio 702, 567 Cape Talk. <coughs> Suddenly, top billing gets hold of him and features these gardens on roofs being built all around Johannesburg and now all around South Africa. And suddenly, he is way out earning the people who graduated at the same time as him. He's no better than them. Might be, might not be. It's nothing to do with his academic background. It's only about the novelty, the unique signature. Now, it's a tricky one, and it's a bit of a brutal question. What's novel or unusual about the way you do things now? Or otherwise stated, if we had to poll your clients, your customers, what I like to call your fan base, your loyal followers, is there anything about the way you do things that would get them talking about you? What is your unique signature? 
In some industries, we are heavily regulated and it's hard to have a unique signature. Here's how one heavily regulated industry player got around that. Anyone flown Kalula lately? What have they done to stand out from the rest? Human. It's the human. It's the, it's the in-flight announcements. My all-time favorite, and I still wake up giggling about this sometimes, was the young lady who stands in front of uh, all of the, all of the, everyone seated uh, in the, the plane, and says, ladies and gentlemen, in the event of an emergency, please put on your own oxygen mask before assisting your child. If you have more than one child, please pick your favorite now. <laughs> it's just humor. But there are websites dedicated to their announcements, and that's remarkable. There are websites dedicated to Jeremy Clarkson's little sayings. You can go on to clarksonisms.com, and it's this thing of going viral just because you're interesting. Finally, experts leave a trail of breadcrumbs. If you go up onto the hillside and they follow you, congratulations, you are a guru. If you go up onto the hillside and they do not follow you, you are a lost hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> to be an industry expert, to be a thought leader, you have to have followers. People have to like and want what you do. They have to talk to other people about it. Why would they do that? There are a few reasons. Either you're giving them excellent advice and visionary ideas about how things can be, or you are simply entertaining to be around. You're putting out content for free. You are both useful and entertaining. Knowledge, personality, publicity. Experts leave a trail of breadcrumbs. One of my own little breadcrumbs is this one, and you're welcome to use it if you want to. On the website ownyourindustry.net, there's only one thing, and that is a little test. It has something like 20 questions that you can answer in two, three minutes. And if you answer the questions honestly, at the end, it spits out a ranking for you telling you where you currently are on the continuum between amateur and expert. And it also then gives you a little bit of a suggestion for what you should be looking at next. Ownyourindustry.net. Now folks, what are your breadcrumbs? The most obvious breadcrumb is a business card that you, you hand to someone. It's got your contact details, now you can be found. But if you're a little bit more creative, what other kinds of breadcrumbs could you leave behind? Could you do a little self-analysis test like that? Could you be uh, offering free YouTube videos, free downloads? What can you give away for free that is so interesting, so quirky, that people want to keep that breadcrumb? Go up onto the mountainside and have them follow you, and you are an expert and a thought leader. You can, of course, do all of these things and still disqualify yourself as an expert. Here are some ways to do that. <laughs> the first, stealing the sugar. You come to a convention or a conference like this one, everyone's networking, you're meeting all the right people, being seen by all the right key players, and just as someone looks around, you take out your Tupperware and put some of the sugar or the meal into it and hide it in your jacket. Stealing the sugar disqualifies you as an expert. How about the spelling mistake? You are the best photographer in the country. Nobody gets better shots of brides and grooms at weddings than you. You hand over the disc on the day and you have misspelled the bride's name. Does it matter how good your work was? We're, uh, my wife and I are having our bathrooms redone at the moment by a guy who specializes in professional tilling, should be tiling. <laughs> <laughs> Neglecting the ribbon. Who here has bought a car, whether it's new or pre-owned in say the last year? Anyone at all? Yeah. What's the one thing you want when you get down to that dealership on the day? Doesn't matter how many hundreds of thousands of rands you've spent, you want that ribbon around the car. Like 5 Rand 50 from CNA, but it had better be there. Because neglecting the ribbon robs us of a sense of occasion. And ribbons don't take money, they take creativity. Simple example. You walk into that one sort of special section at Woolworths, what's it called? China, China Road, something like that? Anyone know? Can't, re can't remember off the top of my head. Get to the counter, you buy yourself a nice new shirt. The lady behind the counter will infallibly say, Excellent choice, sir. Now, it doesn't matter if you've picked up a pair of orange boxer shorts with purple polka dots, she will still look you in the eyes and say, excellent choice, sir. <laughs> then they wrap your shirt for you, and this is the, the ribbon part. She will walk around the counter and present it to you. And it goes from being a shirt to being a shirt. <laughs> your shirt gains an echo. What is the ribbon when dealing with you? What makes the experience of dealing with you so wonderful that people just have to talk about it? 
Neglecting the ribbon disqualifies us as experts. How about the leering uncle? That's that, uh, hello, customer, come sit on my knee. <laughs> I was almost an expert until. Then there's the assumed prejudice. About a year ago, our electric gate breaks at home. The guy comes around to fix it, he brings his team of guys working with him. He stands next to me and makes a series of hardcore racist jokes at their expense in front of them. He assumed I shared his prejudice. I do not. I, work, I vote with my money, he will never be back. That is a silly re reason to disqualify yourself as an industry expert. Experts exist at the inter inter intersection of knowledge, personality and publicity. It's about the value you give to people, but it's also about how wonderful you are to be around, how memorable, the interesting and clever things you do to set yourself apart. Do it just right, and you can own your industry. There's an extra zero at the end of that proposition. God bless and thanks for your time. Douglas, 